Our first lesson this morning is found in Psalm 27. If you'd like to follow along in your pew Bibles, which are in front of you, you may do so in the Old Testament at page 503. Listen for the word of the Lord. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and foes, they shall stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war rise up against me, yet I will be confident. One thing I asked of the Lord that I will seek after, to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will set me high on a rock. Now my head is lifted up above my enemies all around me, and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud, be gracious to me and answer me. Come, my heart says, seek his face. Your face, Lord, do I seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You who have been my help, do not cast me off. Do not forsake me, O God of my salvation. If my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will take me up. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Do not give me up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and they are breathing out violence. I believe that I shall see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong, and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Our second lesson this morning is from Luke 13, verses 31 through 35. And again, if you'd like to read along in, in the Bible, you may do so in the New Testament at page 77. Listen for the further war, word of the Lord. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. He said to them, Go and tell that fox for me, Listen, I am casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow, and in the third day I finish my work. Yet today, tomorrow, and the next day, I must be on my way, because it is impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who sent, are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you, and I tell you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, Blessed is the Lord who comes, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends in Christ, let us turn to the Lord in prayer. You are the center of all reality. And you know how easily and how readily we put other things at the centers of our lives. How we put this or that in the center, thinking that if we can only do this, only accomplish that, then we will be safe and we will be secure. 
but in the pursuit of those things, we become frantic and anxious and are running endlessly because they cannot satisfy. And so we pray, O oh God, that you would help us to once more place you in the center of our lives and to reorganize our agenda, our interests, our time, our calendar, our pocketbooks, reorganize our lives with you at the center, allowing everything else to fall into its proper place. All things we pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. This uh, weekend, I was out walking our dog around the neighborhood, and I ran into one of our neighbors um, on the walk. And uh, my neighbor Louise walks up to me and mentions how discouraged she was by the mass shooting at the New Zealand mosque this past weekend where 50 people were gunned down by a 28-year-old who appears to have become consumed with anti-immigrant, anti-Muslim views. And Louise uh, is talking with me, and, and she says, with some resignation, she says, is it even possible for us to put any more hatred into the world than we have already done? And in addition to the concerns and the fears that we may have about the larger political situations in the world, we all face our own difficulties and challenges and obstacles and burdens in our own lives, in our families, in our communities. We face medical situations. We face relationship breakdowns. We face financial stresses losses great and small, and we could go on and on and on. And we misunderstand the nature of faith if we think that faith will make all of those problems go away. You will still find the occasional religious figure who will tell you that if you believe this, or if you give money to that, or if you sign on to this cause, then you will somehow be protected from bad things. But most people know that there is no religious injection that you can get that inoculates you against all trouble. But we also misunderstand the nature of faith if we think that faith has nothing to offer whatsoever when we find ourselves in the midst of trouble. And again, there are some flavors of religion out there that do describe faith as some otherworldly thing, something that has only to do with the sweet by and by, and that is unconcerned with the messy grind of reality in daily life here on earth that it's all about getting to heaven and it has nothing to do with healing the wounds and the hurts of earth. And it may well be that when younger people reject institutional religion these days, that what they are rejecting is a religion that wants to somehow float up above real life without getting its hands dirty and keeping its hands kind of clean. They intuitively understand that religion that has no word to speak to the difficulties of human existence is religion that is not worth very much. Psalm 27 and Luke chapter 13 that Pam just read for us, both of these texts give us an expression of faith that lives and moves and has its being in the push and shove of life in the public arena where fear and grief and hostility lurk and walk around. In Luke chapter 13, little text from Luke chapter 13, Jesus is on his way to the capital city of Jerusalem when some local Pharisees come up to him and they warn him 
that Herod, Herod Antipas, who was the tetrarch or the ruler of that region of Galilee, that Herod wants to kill him. Now, this will probably not come as much of a surprise to you, but some of us who are religious leaders would be rather unsettled to learn that a political ruler wanted to kill us. Some of us are still somewhat early in the process of learning that we do not need to be afraid of the powers that be in the world. But we may be afraid of that. Jesus was not afraid of that. And I am not making this up. You can see that this is what he says in his response. He's told that Herod wants to kill him. And Jesus' immediate response is, go and tell that fox. Can you imagine? Go tell that fox that I've got work to do, and I'm going to do it. Jesus is not intimidated by Herod. Jesus knows that his power source does not come from public approval or political endorsements. Jesus knows that his power source comes from the divine presence that is all around him and within him. But what I find really remarkable about this little text is that Jesus, though he says pretty dismissively, I think, oh, and tell that fox, though he speaks rather dismissively of Herod, Jesus is not just thumping his chest or strutting about with braggadocio here. Because in the very next breath, after dismissing Herod, Jesus drops down into tender grief about the brutality of the city of Jerusalem. So, I mean, this is something. Here we got Jesus, and he is clearly not that worried about Herod. He is not that worried. He is on his way to the capital city where as soon as he gets there, soon after he gets there, he will go into the temple, turn over the the money changers' tables, which is to say he is going in, he's going to confront the temple leadership and the power structure there. So if this were a movie, the way that I imagine what Jesus would have said next is something like, Jerusalem, I'm coming for you. But he doesn't say that. Instead, Jesus begins to weep. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, he says, you who kill your prophets and stone your messengers, how often I have desired to gather your children together like little baby chicks under my generous wings. Jesus is clearly not intimidated by the powerful people in Jerusalem or in Galilee. But Jesus does not become a bully himself. Jesus can see, can see through Jerusalem's violence to the brokenness that lies within Jerusalem that is generating the violence, and the brokenness makes Jesus weep. And so Jesus then continues to move towards it, willing to accept the attacks that he knows are coming his way. And as he does that, he clearly cherishes the city of Jerusalem, even as he knows what it is going to do to him. And so I think that one of the things that enabled Jesus to move towards Jerusalem in that way is that Jesus was a child of Psalm 27. And as I mentioned at the 830 service, I know some of you get tired of hearing me say this, but this is a text that you ought to commit to memory. Psalm 27 should be on your short list of psalms to commit to memory. Jesus would have grown up praying and learning Psalm 27 at home, would have grown up learning the psalms in his home and in his community, his religious community. And with Psalm 27... Jesus would have absorbed its spirituality that is a spirituality that engages a disputatious world and does so with confidence, with courage, and with joy. I mean, listen to these things that the psalmist talks about. 
When evildoers assail me to devour my flesh, though an army encamp around me, though war rise up against me, false witnesses have risen against me, they are breathing out violence. This psalmist of Psalm 27, this psalmist lives as do you and I in a world of turmoil and turbulence and contestation. And so to anyone who would say that biblical faith is all about rising up above all of the slings and arrows of outrageous and whatever misfortune, however that goes, Psalm 27 is not a spirituality of escape. But neither was the psalmist saying rather flippantly, well, you got a lot of trouble. Good luck with that. The psalmist knew, as did, as did Jesus, and as can we, that in the midst of grief and fear and turmoil and conflict, we are not left on our own. God goes with us into every situation. In fact, by the time we get there, God has already been there before we get there. Whenever you wade into the waters of upset in your life, wherever you find the waters of upset and difficulty in your life, you never, never wade in on your own. The Lord is your light and your salvation. Whom shall you fear? The Lord is the stronghold of your life. Of whom shall you be afraid? Now the psalm begins with these rhetorical questions, and the answers to these rhetorical questions are intended to be, huh, I do not need to be afraid of anyone or anything anymore. The Lord's presence the Lord's presence is a kind of north star for you, showing you where to go and what to do in every single situation. And the only difference is that with the Lord, the north star is also within you, always present, always there to guide you, to shelter you in times of trouble, and to illuminate, as Allison said, to illuminate whatever darkness you may find yourself in. The Lord's light within us, beyond us, around us, the Lord's light cannot be extinguished by anything or anyone, and you can recover from anything. You can never, ever, nothing whatsoever in all of creation, can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So when my neighbor Louise, when my neighbor Louise asked me, and we were talking about whether it was possible to put any more hatred out into the world, she and I both agreed that unfortunately it is indeed quite possible for more hatred and violence to be put into the world. Evil and sin should never be underestimated. We Presbyterians, one of the strengths of our tradition is that we have a very strong understanding of the doctrine of sin. That's true. What's also true is that down through the ages we have been accused of being rather dour and grim because of our very strong understanding of the doctrine of sin. That's also true. But because of that, Presbyterians should never be surprised. We should never be surprised to find sin and violence and evil erupting in the world because we understand that sin's power is very great. Sin and evil and manipulation and fear are very powerful realities in our world. We need not pretend otherwise. Jesus did not pretend otherwise. Jesus, you can see in the text, 
he is not surprised that the Jerusalem establishment will want to do him in. When the Pharisees come to him and they say, uh, you need to get out of here because Herod wants to kill you, Jesus does not say, what? What do you, why would that happen? Jesus is not surprised by it at all. The establishment and the powers that be always want to do Jesus in. But Jesus does not let that deter him. Jesus does not let it take away his sense of humor. For he very quickly refers to Herod as, oh, that fox, go tell that fox, I've got my work to do. But neither does he let it take away his heart of grief and compassion for the unnecessary brutality of the city of Jerusalem as he weeps over the city that he loved. You can tell by the way he talks about it, that he loves Jerusalem even as he knows what it is likely to do to him. Jesus walked into Jerusalem even as you and I walk deeper into the season of Lent and into the midst of whatever difficulties you are facing in your life. Jesus walked into his challenge with his head held high, almost as though he were reciting the end of Psalm 27 as he made his way, saying, wait for the Lord. Be strong. Let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. To God and to God alone be the glory. Amen. Friends, let us pray. Take away our fear. Take away our anxiety. Take away our greed. Take away our preoccupation with ourselves. And recenter us on you. And allow that recentering, Lord, to reorganize everything about us in order that we may discover once more the complete freedom that you are inviting us to this day. In Christ we pray. Amen.